Welcome to another edition of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. I'm James Messer, and in this edition, we're going to talk about troubleshooting motherboards. We're going to run into situations where motherboards aren't working, and in this CompTIA exam objective, this comes from our 220-602, section 1.3, where we want to learn to apply basic troubleshooting techniques to search for problems with motherboards. And uh, what we're going to learn is these troubleshooting techniques. What are these things we should do to help troubleshoot motherboards? We'll talk about how heat can be a problem, how sometimes software can be incompatible with our motherboard hardware, and we'll also talk about hmm, when our hardware fails completely. Always a bad thing. How do you fix that on a motherboard? We'll start with troubleshooting our motherboard. And what you'll find often is the motherboard has so many different components on it that when we're trying to figure out where the problems are coming from, dividing it up into separate pieces and trying to conquer and troubleshoot one piece at a time makes a lot of sense. If your motherboard is coming from a certain manufacturer, often that manufacturer will have a diagnostics disk. And that diagnostics disk is just for the hardware for that system. Especially larger manufacturers will often have these diag disks. So those are useful as well. There's also a number of third party diagnostics you can use. There was a video that we We've done that talked about boot CDs and boot DVDs that also have a number of diagnostics on there. There are a lot of uh, really interesting boot CDs that can run some third party tests for you that might go above and beyond what a manufacturer might provide. And that's because the faults you may get are very randomized and they could be caused due to heat or incompatibilities with the BIOS or failing hardware. Often with the motherboard, it's either not working or it is working. And when it's these random problems, that becomes a little bit more difficult to troubleshoot. When something goes bad with a motherboard, there's really not much you can do other than replace the entire motherboard. But some of these other problems we can begin addressing in different ways. So we'll begin dividing and conquering. We'll try to isolate that one component and troubleshoot it. Sometimes putting it on the bench and running diagnostics on memory for 24 hours might make you feel better about whether that memory is working or not. And running that diagnostics on every single piece is going to give you a little bit more insight into the pieces that you know are working properly. If you run that diagnostics for 24 hours, you're going to feel pretty good about that memory. You also, if you're in a larger organization with a lot of different motherboards, you might also be in a case where you can start swapping out different hardware components. That if you've tried it with this system, let's replace the memory with memory that we know is good, and we'll run it for another 24 hours and see what happens. We'll run that problem with that software that you were having. We'll see if it's a memory problem. If it continues to happen, well, you'll know that it's definitely not the memory. If it happens uh, happens again, then well, we got to work on that one. We got to go to another piece of hardware and see where the problem happened. We could also try bypassing the motherboard completely. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but that becomes a, a little bit more of a challenge when maybe you won't use an aspect of the motherboard. When you look at running a diagnostic disk or running some diagnoses uh, for the motherboard, get the the motherboard CD or the the, the drive that came with the motherboard itself. Uh, sometimes you go to the manufacturer's website and download some diagnostics. and uh, That helps also if your motherboard is still under warranty. If you run the manufacturer's diagnostics and the manufacturer's diagnostics are saying there's a problem, that's some pretty good justification to call them up and say, I ran your test and your test is telling me that this is a bad piece on my motherboard. They may be more apt to swap it out a lot quicker. And again, that third party diagnostics could come in really handy. One of the things that we might also want to think about using if the system isn't even starting at all is to use these, uh, these postcards, power on self test is what that stands for. And what happens is when you turn on your system, there are a number of tests that your computer will go through before anything else will happen. That's called a power on self test. And it, because one of the problems you might have are never going to allow the monitor to show you anything, these postcards will give a message on their little cards on the LCD screens, and it will tell you what error is happening during that post process. This is what some of these postcards look like. This one's for a PCI card. And here, as you can see, that's where it lights up with the numbers as it goes through its testing process. This is a, another card. It, it's one that happens to work in either a P 
PCI bus or you turn it the other way and it works in an old ISA bus as well. It's nice to have that too. And it's got a lot of what we call them the dummy lights. They're LEDs and lights that will turn on to tell you if the memory or the, uh, the power is good, if the clocking is good, and it lets you know that other aspects of the motherboard are working as you might expect. One of the things that you'll run into with heat on a motherboard is that when the system is cold and you turn it on, it works for a while, but then it starts getting warm. And inside the motherboard, the components begin to expand a little bit because they're now getting much warmer. And it's that constant expanding and contraction as the system turns on and off that sometimes creates problems with connections and systems and sometimes creates problems with the components on the motherboards themselves. Heat itself, especially excessive heat, is going to shorten the lifetime of the components on your system. So keeping it cool is going to be useful just from a preventive maintenance perspective. Make sure the airflow is very clear. Make sure that you're able to clean this out and there's no cables in the way. And often if there's a problem with a system that's becoming too warm and failing and you think it's a motherboard problem, sometimes just clearing it out, cleaning it out, making sure the airflow goes through there well is going to fix the problem. A motherboard problem I thought I was having was with a system where the fan was broken and the air was not flowing through it. Just replacing the fan solved a lot of the problems that I thought were going to be with the motherboard itself. And if it's a situation where you just can't have any more fans in the system, or maybe you need to add additional fans, also think about adding heat sinks uh, to some of these uh, systems, especially these larger and, and newer video cards that don't come with heat sinks. There are a lot of third party and aftermarket options there. You might want to think about adding some additional heat sinks or putting fans on top of heat sinks that might already be in the system. That will help a lot with your heat as well. Here's an example of having some of those fans on top of heat sinks that are sitting right on top of the CPUs on my system. And you can see that's a good way to, there's even a place where you plug in a CPU fan for each one of these. So this motherboard is already expecting that you're going to have a fan sitting right on top of a heat sink that's sitting right on top of these very hot processors inside of this computer. You may run into problems with software where it's not acting exactly as it should with this motherboard. And one of the things that you might want to try is upgrading the basic input-output system or the BIOS that's inside this motherboard. The BIOS is firmware that really tells the motherboard how to operate at a very basic level. It's a good first step when you're troubleshooting because if there are unusual problems with the way that a laptop goes into suspend mode, maybe the way that a power management is being handled. These are higher level BIOS issues. And you may want to go down to those BIOS release notes and see if there's a new version out and what that new version is supposed to fix. You may find that a newer version of BIOS gets rid of these problems that were you were having with a CD-ROM or a DVD or with your power settings. You want to be very, very careful when upgrading the BIOS. One of the things you'll notice as you begin an upgrade process for a BIOS, the thing that it puts on the screen is don't touch. Do not disrupt this process. Don't power off. Don't have any problems because what happens is it removes the current BIOS and then begins writing the new BIOS. And it takes a minute or so for that to happen. It's not an extremely fast process. And if you happen to lose power right in the middle, you now end up with a system that is essentially, well, we call it bricked. It doesn't work anymore. And there's no way to go back in and update that BIOS. You always want to have a backup plan. Some BIOS on some systems, you can actually remove the chip and put a new BIOS chip in. Other systems won't allow that. So make sure that you're not upgrading this in the middle of a thunderstorm, that you make sure you're plugged into a proper power receptacle. If you're upgrading the BIOS on a laptop, one of the things it checks for is to see if you're using it on battery. And it won't allow you to upgrade the BIOS if you're using the battery so that there's no accidental power off in the middle of the upgrade process. Sometimes a motherboard component will go out and we need to bypass it. This is not always a bad thing. Sometimes you want to bypass the, the video or the audio that's built into the motherboard and you'd like to use better audio and better video and you do that by bypassing the motherboard. In my case, I had a motherboard where the ethernet that was built into the motherboard connection stopped working completely, just wouldn't work anymore. Something associated with that ethernet network component was not working properly. The rest of the motherboard worked exactly the way it should. It just couldn't see a network connection. So I ended up getting a separate card and installing it. 
and having that be my Ethernet card in the system. And I just bypassed that in the BIOS. I, I uh, went into the BIOS and turned off the setting that enabled the port on the motherboard just to make sure those resources weren't allocated by something else. And if you do have ports on the back of your system that you're not using, sometimes a good best practice to have those just disabled so that those resources are available for other things in your system. When you add a new device, also keep in mind you may need new device drivers as well. And that's what happened with my Ethernet card. I put a new Ethernet card in my system. It was very different than the Ethernet card that was built into the motherboard, and I needed a whole new set of drivers. So make sure that you're expecting when you turn this back on and it starts up your Windows operating system or your Linux operating system, that it's not going to automatically see your Ethernet connection. You're going to need to load new drivers for that. So in review, that's our troubleshooting process. We want to look at how we're troubleshooting the system, maybe get some postcards so we can understand more about what's happening with that motherboard. Make sure that we have allocated the proper amount of cooling and thermal protection to get rid of as much heat as possible. Upgrade our BIOS to make sure there's no incompatibilities between the motherboard, basic functions of the motherboard, and the software that we happen to be running. And sometimes looking at a hardware failure, we can either work around the hardware failure or when the problem is the motherboard itself, sometimes you have to swap out the entire motherboard. There's nothing else you can do. For more a videos, for our study guides, and for message boards, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.